We come now to look at the effects of the fall, that is the effects of the sin of Adam and Eve. And uh, the next question in the Catechism is, into what estate did the fall bring mankind? And the answer is, the fall brought mankind into an estate of sin and misery. And question 18, wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate wherein man fell? In other words, what's it all about? What's it like? And the answer is the sinfulness of that estate or that condition wherein man fell consists in the guilt of Adam's first sin, the want or the lack of original righteousness and the corruption of his whole nature, which is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions which proceed from it. And question 19 is, what is the misery of that estate wherein man fell? And the answer is, all mankind, by their fall, lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and so made liable to all the miseries of this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Okay then, let's continue. So survivors of life-threatening illnesses know full well that even after they are rescued and recovered from death's door, there are often serious after effects that can never be shaken off. A stroke, for example, may leave a limp or slurred speech forever. A heart attack may render someone significantly less energetic and cancer survivors may for the rest of their lives bear on their bodies the marks of both their sickness and its treatments. So it's true to say that we are living out the scars of sin sickness even today. The wickedness of our own selfish hearts and the sorrows of the world around us are the far-reaching effects or after effects, should I say, of Adam's first transgression in the garden. So let's look at the idea of original sin. So that this first sin has brought all of humanity to experience what is known as original sin, which is commonly misunderstood to, to refer to that initial sin of eating the forbidden fruit. No, it's called original sin, firstly, because it is derived or got from or its sources from the original root of the human race. And secondly, because it is present in the life of every individual from the time of their birth and therefore cannot be regarded as the result of imitation. And thirdly, because it is the inward root of all the actual sins that defile the life of humanity. So in other words, original sin is not the first sin of Adam and Eve. It is the state that their sin has left us in. So original sin has two components, which is guilt and corruption. Guilt means that before God, the judge, we stand condemned because of our sinfulness, as we read in the Roman book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 10 and 23. Corruption means that there is both an absence of original righteousness and the presence of actual evil, resulting in an inability to do any good to get out of our condemned state, as we read in Psalm chapter 51 verse 5. So this means we are born into a state where we are already guilty because of Adam's representative sin. That is the idea of the federal head or Adam being the representative of humanity. And we are actually morally corrupt and defiled by our own transgressions. 
we can't just blame Adam, we take the blame ourselves. So the pollution of sin gives us the doctrine known as total depravity. Now it's true to say there has been some confusion over this doctrine, over this idea. It does not mean that every person is as sinful as they can be, that every unregenerate person will indulge in every form of sin, or that we can never do anything good. No, that's not what it means. It refers to the corruption of our whole nature. In uh, the words of 18th century theologian Taylor Lewis, it is a term of extensivity rather than intensity. In other words, it extends to all of us and it's not necessarily sin in its worst sense, like we're not all murderers or bank robbers or liars or thieves, that type of thing. So interesting. So it leads to eternal misery and it's um uh, there's an interesting quote here from John Owen, who was uh, a, a Puritan um, theologian. He wrote that in that communion with God consists in his communication of himself to us with our return unto him of that which he requires and accepts. So no one needs a lesson in what it's like to be out of fellowship from God. Every day, the news gives us plenty of commentary on what it means for mankind to live outside the sweet and peaceful communion with God. Daily, we live at the threshold of death, awaiting the pains of hell forever, we could say. We know this innately. We know it in our inner man, but the scriptures point out, point it out explicitly as we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 23 all man's days are sorrowful and his work burdensome even in the night his heart takes no rest this is also vanity and even the apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 7 verse 15 what I will what I will to do what I want to do that I do not practice but what I hate that I do so it's true to say that scripture's honest assessment of our sinful condition is actually a sign of God's grace to us. Jonathan Edwards said this, if we, as we come into this world, are truly sinful and consequently miserable, he acts but a friendly part to us, talking of God, of course, who endeavours fully to discover to us or reveal to us our disease. So God reveals our misery to us so that we would be ready for the cure. And the cure is Jesus Christ. So while sin in mankind provokes God's wrath, for those who are his precious people, it also provokes his mercy. When we think of the pity that God showed towards Israel, where he heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham with Isaac and with Jacob and God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them as we read in the book of Exodus chapter 2 verses 24 to 25. So sinners, that's you and I, who cry out to God because of their misery, misery receive from God his mercy. Praise the Lord. Yes, the scars and effects of sin are are far-reaching and long-lasting but the gospel is the announcement that God comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found as Isaac Watts wrote in his wonderful hymn Joy to the world the Lord is come. <laughs> 